Hey everyone, I'm Rather Incoherent, and this is Arkham Horror the Card Game. It's very different from the sort of content I've been putting out previously, so I figured I would start with a brief tutorial series for the game. There are a lot of different ways to teach and to learn, and I figured that I'll be best at teaching in the same way that I learn. For me, the best way to learn is to watch somebody else do something and have them carefully explain it while they're doing it. And I can get a pretty good grasp of what they're doing by that. So, I'm going to be playing through the campaign you get with the core box, the Night of the Zealot, which consists of three scenarios, the Gathering, the Midnight Mask, and the Vower Below. And this video will just be playing the Gathering, and I'm going to try to lay down a foundational groundwork for how the game works before we get into it. If you've never played a game like Arkham Horror before, it's sort of a blend of board game and card game. You have locations on the map, and while the first scenario is not a great example, the second scenario looks a lot more like a traditional board game with several locations around the map. And you'll move your investigator between those locations performing various actions, which will be determined by the cards in your hand. And the cards in your hand, of course, will be built between scenarios according to the rules on your investigator card. And I think the investigator card is the best place to start to begin talking about how the game works. This is Rex Murphy. He's an incredibly good but also very simple seeker, which is why I've chosen him as one of the characters in this tutorial. And already I need to explain what seekers are, what the classes are. Blue characters like Roland Banks here are called Guardians. They tend to specialize in having a high fist stat and using that stat to kill the enemies the games throw at you. And it's not called fist, I believe it's officially called strength, maybe power, but you can immediately see why everyone who plays the game eventually ends up calling the stats by their icons rather than their names, it's just faster and easier. Next we have the yellow class, Seekers. They specialize in having a high book and using that to investigate locations and find clues. Clues being the resource you will need to progress the act deck and eventually win the scenario. We'll get more into that later. Next we have rogues like Schizo Tool. They tend to specialize in having a high foot stat, and foot is one of the two defensive stats. You see, these previous two characters, Guardians and Seekers, specialize in fist and book, and you use these proactively to impact the game state. But when the game is attacking you, you're generally going to be rolling those outside two stats, your brain and your foot, to defend yourself. Without getting too deep into a balance discussion, which is outside the scope of this video, specializing in foot is not a very good place to live in, and especially with more limited collections, rogues feel very weak. This fact is only exacerbated by the fact that Schizo Tool is the worst rogue in the game, and he's the first one you get to interact with. Getting back to tutorial things, though, Agnes Baker is a mystic. That's the class that specializes in head, which is your other defensive stat. And the reason this is much better than specializing in foot is twofold. The first is that there are just a lot more things that test your head than that test your foot. And the second is that mystics have a huge variety of cards that allow them to use their head in other ways that would normally be the realm of book test or fist test. And lastly, we have the odd duck of the group, Survivor. As you might be able to tell immediately by the stat line, Survivor specializes in just having high defensive stats in general and, well, surviving. Every survivor plays relatively differently. There's no two survivors that run the same deck and perform optimally. Generally speaking, they're all strong and interesting and different, and hard to talk about as a homogenous mass the way the other classes can be. So with all of that out of the way, now that you have a better understanding of the classes and the stats, coming back to Rex, because he has a 4 in book, that's pretty good. He's able to find clues fairly reliably. He has a 3 in his head and his foot, so defensively he's really solid and a two and fist, so he's not ever really going to be punching anything, but that's fine because it's not his job. You see, I'm playing with two characters. Arkham Horror is not a game that's really balanced for playing single player. You're expected to play two to four players, and the expected way for people to play the game single player is not to play it with one investigator, but to control two investigators simultaneously. Rex's job is to find the clues. Daniela Ray's job is to be the muscle and make sure that he'll be perfectly fine. Looking at her stat line, you can see that she has a 5 and fist. She's very good at killing things, and conversely, her 1 in book means she is not doing the clue bit. That's entirely on Rex. That's his job. Her 4 in head means she's really resilient to that sort of attack against her, but if something is going to make her take a foot test, she's probably going to fail it with her 2 in foot. Of course, there's a lot more on the cards than just what I've been talking about so far, because the stat lines are just the most basic part. At the bottom, you can see an 8 heart and a 6 brain. That is the amount of damage and horror you can take before you either die or go insane. 8 and 6 is a pretty good spread, and I believe Rex is, yes, very similar at 6 and 9. There's also abilities on the card. Both characters have the bottom ability that's triggered by that star effect, and then a top ability that varies from character to character. So talking about this star effect, called the Elder Sign effect, 
requires me to talk about skill checks, and I'll get into that when we get into skill checks. But the top effect is the thing that is the most unique about investigators. Everyone is different. Some of them, like Daniela's, you do as a reaction to something. Some of them are passive and happen constantly. Some of them just say you start with a specific card in play, and some of them are an activated ability that you can only use once per game. Daniela's says that after an enemy attacks you, except for an attack of opportunity that you provoked, which we will get into later, even if that attack was cancelled, either deal one damage to that enemy or automatically evade it. So, to shorten that up a bit, deal one damage to an enemy when they hit you, or evade them, which means they can't hit you again. Rexus is a much simpler ability, and also a disgustingly strong one. After you succeed at a skill test by two or more by investigating, discover one clue at your location. Investigating normally gives you one clue, so you're getting twice as much value from your skill test as long as you can pass by two. Now, we aren't quite done with our investigator cards yet, because they have a backside, but this we can gloss over pretty quickly. The backside of the card gives you that character's story and the rules for building their deck. I'm not going to be covering deck building in this video. I'm also not going to be covering buying guides or how the campaigns are organized. Because those are both very large, different topics that need to be covered in their own videos. And simultaneously, I'm not sure I could cover them any better than the Playing Board Games channel already has, so what would even be the point? For the time being, though, what you need to know is that the back of an investigator card tells you the rules for building your decks. And that's about it. For Rex Murphy, he gets to build a deck with Seeker cards, all of them, neutral cards, all of them, and up to five level zero cards from any of the other classes. He has a 30 card deck, which is the normal size. Daniela Rays is a much different investigator. She starts off with Guardian level zero cards and then upgrades to Survivor level one to five cards, essentially transitioning classes as she levels up. And at the bottom here, these deck building requirements are unique cards that only that investigator ever gets. Everyone gets one random weakness, but Mob Goons and Mechanic Switch are the cards that only Daniela will ever get to play with. So, with that out of the way, I think it's time that we talk about what the scenario we're actually playing is. In real life, if you were setting this up at a table, you would open this book here, read all the story, come to campaign setup, and you would be told, gather all the encounter sets, lay out these locations, set these things aside, and then at do not read, you wait until you finish the scenario to see what resolution you got. On tabletop sim, you hit place, and that's it. All of these cards right here were originally in the set aside box. I always take them out and set them aside visibly like I would have them at the table. I find that really helps me to make sure I'm not forgetting something. Having them physically here helps me remember that like, oh hey, the scenario's about to end and something hasn't entered play, I must have done something wrong. Just makes me more aware of what's going on in the game. Make sure that I don't accidentally break any rules or forget something really important. Once you've assembled your scenario, you're going to have an act deck, which is your objective. The flavor text is in italics. What you really need to know here is that we need two clues per investigator, that's what the little head symbol means, to advance the act. And once we have that, during any investigator's turn, we can just spend those clues and advance the act. And there are several acts until eventually you finish the scenario. You want to progress all the way through this act deck, which will usually be done via clues, but sometimes other effects, until the scenario ends to get a positive resolution. And this agenda deck is going to be gaining one doom per turn. There are other ways that it can gain more, but typically it's just taking up at a rate of one doom per game round. Likewise, you will be drawing one encounter card per game round, and these encounter cards are always something bad. Dissident Voices, for instance, says put Dissident Voices into your threat area, which, to be clear, is the set of cards in front of you. And while it is there, you cannot play assets or events, and then at the end of the round, you discard it. So just for the round, you cannot play two of the three types of cards. Something worth mentioning about this chaos bag, by the way, is there are various difficulties that determine which chaos bag you'll actually be getting. It's part of your campaign setup down here, and typically I always play on standard. Uh, for reasons I don't want to get into within this video, I find that switching to hard or expert really just makes the game harder in a not very interesting way, and standard is a pretty good difficulty for the game to be at. My opinion on that may change with more time and experience, but right now I just don't see a reason to change off of standard. And if you want to play it easy while you're learning the game, that is probably recommended. The game can be pretty brutal. And now I think I've talked about everything in the game that doesn't involve actually playing the game. So let's get into it. We would start at this location. So the first thing we would do when the game actually starts, we would check the agenda and the act. Three do until it advances. We need four clues. And then we would flip our starting location, in this case, the only location, the study. And we have four clues and a two shroud room. What does that mean? 
Well, clues are the thing we need to progress the act, and coincidentally, the same number of clues are on this location as we need to progress, we just need to get all of them to get out of here. You find them by performing investigate actions, which is the thing that Rex Murphy and Seekers in general specialize in. And this number here is the difficulty check of that investigation. The black number 2 to Shroud is the difficulty of our investigate check against our base of 4 book. But we obviously aren't quite ready to do that yet, we need to draw our opening hands. So you start with 5 resources and 5 cards and hand. However, we don't just take the first 5 cards we see. We have a mulligan, and if you've played Hearthstone it's exactly the same. You can take any number of cards in your opening hand, set them aside, and redraw that many cards. Now, I won't be getting into exactly why I'm doing the mulligans I'm doing right now, but generally, I won't Mr. Milan here because he's very, very good at giving me more book and more economy. I don't think I will need any more economy than him, and I don't think I need damage yet, and read the signs of very good cards, I'll be keeping that. And if you're wondering why there are so many colors in this hand, Rex Murphy, again, has Seeker cards, and then... He has up to five level zero cards of other classes. For me, I chose Lucky Cigarette Case, which is synergizing directly with his Succeed by Two thing to draw a card, and Read the Signs, which puts two stats together to investigate for an additional clue, which also pretty much guarantees that he's going to trigger his ability and get a third clue. Now, coming over to Daniela's Mulligan, her job is to fight. Rex has clues handled. All she needs to do is kill everyone, but she doesn't have a single weapon in her hand, so we're mulliganing all of this. We're going to take five new cards. And we got a pair of weapons. Well, we got a 45 automatic, which is explicitly a weapon, and a mechanics wrench, which isn't legally speaking a weapon, but it's her unique card, and it's definitely going to perform well enough at killing enemies. I'll cover exactly what these cards do as I play them throughout the scenario. And again, cards set aside, go back into the deck once you're done with the mulligan phase, and you shuffle the deck. And now we're ready to begin the game and start talking about Arkham Horror as it's actually played. So now that we're ready to play the game, let's talk about what that actually entails. We have round sequence here, which explains to you the series of events that happens in the game. There's the mythos phase, which you skip during the first round, so we're going to cover it when we actually get to it. The investigation phase, where each investigator takes a turn, and then in that turn they perform three actions. The enemy phase, which where enemies will move if they can because of the hunter keyword, and then attack if there's anyone for them to attack. And then the upkeep phase, which is where you ready all the things that you use that have once per round limitations. You draw a card and gain a resource, and you check your hand size because you can't go over 8 without cards that affect it. And then during your turn, there's a list of actions you can perform. You can just draw a card or gain a resource. You can play an event or asset from your hand, paying its cost. And fast cards, that is a keyword, specifically do not cost an action to play. Uh, your assets will have little arrow abilities on them. These mean that they cost an action to use. This gun takes an action to shoot. This wrench doesn't take an action to make an enemy attack you, but it does take an action to fight. And we'll get into why you'd want that in a little bit, but the summary is Daniela Ray's ability. You can investigate your location, that's just going to be a book test by default. You can fight or engage an enemy at your location, and we'll get more into what that means when we have enemies to talk about, and you can attempt to evade an enemy. Same story, once we have enemies, we'll talk about it. Lightning bolts and reactions do not cost actions to activate. So let's actually start talking about what the game looks like. For Rex, the first thing I'm going to do is play Mr. Milan as an action and for four resources. And then for my last resource, I'm going to play a magnifying glass. Magnifying glass says fast, so it doesn't cost an action to play. And between these, I'm up to six book. Because Milan also gives me a book, and I get the book from investigating from magnifying glass, which is pretty much the only thing I care about book four. And if I succeed, I'll also get a resource from Milan. So I'm investigating at 6 to 2 as my second action. I get minus 2, so that's 4, which is up by 2. So I get two clues, as Rex Murphy is a very fair and balanced character. And I'll gain a resource. And it seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to just do that again, doesn't it? This time I only get one clue, but I will still get the resource from Milan. Now, at this point, I feel I need to tell you about something called the Taboo List. I'm not playing with it because new players shouldn't. But once you're better at the game, two of these cards I'm playing right now have been tabooed to be limited to once per round effects, and it's for kind of obvious reasons. Once, like what Rex does and what Milan do is blatantly overtuned, but don't dwell on it too much when you're new. Your collection is limited, and just enjoy the fact that they're overpowered for a little bit before you implement the essentially errata list that the taboo list is. Now that's Rex's whole turn, so we're gonna flip him. And we're going to take Daniela's turn. 
Now, Daniela has a book of one. She will not be getting that last clue. Unfortunately, she also doesn't have nearly enough money to play all the cards in her hand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend all of my money and my first two actions playing a Mechanics Wrench and a Guard Dog. Oh, and I should have covered this when I was playing Rex, but these assets I just played have little icons in the bottom right. They take up slots, which in the tabletop sim are marked on a mat in front of you. You only have one ally slot. You have two hand slots, obviously. And I've done an ally and a hand slot for both of these characters so far. But if I wanted to play another ally past this, I couldn't. I would have to replace the guard dog. And eventually you can buy upgrade cards called Charisma to get more ally slots in specific. But that's sort of beyond the scope of this video. Now what guard dog does is he has three health and one sanity. The damage that I take can be placed on Guard Dog instead of me. It doesn't have to be placed on you. If you have any assets in front of you with Soak on them, which is the general term for health and sanity, you can assign it to them instead. And Guard Dog has his reaction ability. When an enemy attack deals damage to Guard Dog, because I've assigned it to him, deal one damage to the attacking enemy. So he's just able to fight back against enemies, which synergizes nicely with Mechanic's Wrench. Daniela raises this unique asset. You can exhaust it as a fast action and then choose an enemy at your location. That enemy attacks you, which is normally not a good thing for anyone else. But on the second action of this, the actual fight action, you use this ability only against an enemy that has attacked you since the end of your last turn. So like the one you just triggered with the first ability, you get plus two fight for this and deal plus one damage for the attack. So the first ability triggers this, which wouldn't be that great on its own, but you can put that damage you take from the attack on the guard dog. And since an enemy just attacked me, and it wasn't an attack of opportunity, it was triggered by the wrench, that's something different. I can deal a damage to the enemy or evade him. I can get benefits from being Daniela Ray's. So all of this stuff works together very nicely. And for Daniela Ray's last action, I'm just going to use it to gain a resource. Now, again, after the investigation phase where we both take our three actions, we come to the enemy phase. There are no enemies, we haven't drawn any encounter cards yet, so we skip that as well. We come to the upkeep phase. We ready all of our cards, including flipping the minis. And you would gain one resource and draw a card in real life, but there's a handy dandy upkeep button in the tabletop simulator version. And then we come to the mythos phase. We first replace one doom on the agenda, and since it's not at three yet, it doesn't advance. We're just feeling a little bit of dread about how close we're getting. So now we come to the most dangerous part of the game. Each investigator draws one card from the top of the encounter deck. That's this little deck of cards you built here, and in tabletop sim, this button here just draws a card at random for you. So due to dissonant voices, Rex Murphy will be unable to play assets or events until the end of the round. Considering that's his entire hand, that's a little bit bleh. Well, he does have one, but he won't be able to use it really. Now, I just drew Swarm of Rats for Daniela, but I realized I should talk about dissonant voices a little more because I haven't really talked about it. All the cards I've played so far have been assets. However, there are three types of cards. There are also event cards, which you play as a one-and-done sort of thing. You use them, and then they go into your discard pile. And then there are skill cards, which are a different sort of one-and-done, where whenever you take a skill test, these contribute specifically to that skill test, and you get a benefit based on the specific skill card. Dissonant Voices limits me to only being able to play skill cards. Now, Swarm of Rats is the first enemy card we've seen. These numbers at the top. Its fist of one means if you're trying to punch it to kill it, you'll be testing against a difficulty of one. If you're trying to evade it to stop it from attacking you, you'll be testing at a foot of three. And if you are trying to kill it or deal damage to it in any way, that middle number is its one health. At the bottom of the card, here in the middle, you see one heart on the left side. That means if it hits you, it just deals one damage and no horror. At the top and bold, we have its tags. The only tags that these rats have is creature. And then that first line of text is its keywords, its traits. It's a hunter. That means that it will move to find somebody to fight during the enemy phase. Not all creatures do this. Some creatures will just stay right where they are. Now, this War of Rats is a very basic enemy, but it helps us to talk about the basic rules of engagement. See, right now, because I've drawn the card, I spawned it with me. Anytime anyone draws an enemy, it spawns engaged with them, unless it has the specific keyword spawn that will then tell you where to spawn it instead. So, to talk about enemies a little bit more, Anytime you draw an enemy card, it will always spawn engaged with you, unless it has a specific keyword called spawn, which will tell you to put it somewhere else. When an enemy is engaged with you, that means you can attack it without penalty. If you imagine these cards have been drawn flip-flopped, and Rex had this rat, if Daniela tried to hit that rat, 
If she missed, which is admittedly very unlikely, she would deal her damage to Rex instead. And to avoid that, she could spend an action to engage with the rats. And now there would be no penalty for missing. Putting our game state back the way it was before I demonstrated that. The other thing that being engaged with an enemy does is it allows you to do two things. The first is you're able to test foot to evade the enemy. An evaded enemy would be set to its exhausted state, and exhausted enemies don't attack during the enemy phase. It would also no longer be engaged with you, it would just be at the location, idle. And it would ready and get rid of this during the enemy phase, and then if there's anyone in the room, it would just re-engage with them. We're not going to be doing that. Nine times out of ten, evading an enemy is just less optimal than killing them outright. Because why specialize in delaying the problem when you can just hit them with your wrench at 5 to 1? However, before I do that, there's one last thing to talk about. It's called an attack opportunity. When you're engaged with an enemy, if you do something other than fight them, try to evade them, or a parlay action, which is a scenario-specific action that we'll talk about when we see it, that enemy will attack you. If I try to spend an action to gain a resource, he hits me for 1 damage. Now, I could just assign that to my guard dog and kill the rat with the guard dog's effect, but guard dog is a limited resource, so I won't be doing that. So instead of all that, we're just going to punch the rat. We can't use the wrench without letting the rat hit us, so we're just going to punch straight forward at 5 to 1, because this thing only has one fist, so we're pretty much hitting it guaranteed. And it's got one health, so even though a basic punch only deals one damage, that's plenty. We get our Elder Sign, which is just plus one, it doesn't really matter, but the rat's dead. With our next two actions, there's really not a lot to do right now. I'm going to draw one card to see if it affects my decision making, and then I'm going to gain a resource. And I'm wanting to gain resources so that I can play a gun so that I have a weapon that I can use that doesn't require me to be hit, in case I don't want to get hit by something for whatever reason. And that is Daniela's turn. Next, Rex is going to try to get the last clue. He's just going to be investigating at 6 to whatever. Ah, uh, 6 minus 4 is 2, so we still get the one clue. And Milan will give us a resource, and we immediately spend these clues to progress the act. Four clues, which is the same as our two per player threshold of four. So we have some flavor text on the back, but at the bottom you see the actual meaningful things in the game. It's telling us to put into play the set aside hallway, cellar, attic, and park locations, discard each enemy in the study, place each investigator in the hallway, and remove the study from the game. So it turns out killing the rat was wholly unnecessary, but oh well. So right now I'm going through the last stages of setup for what it's told me to do. I got out all the locations, placed them according to their connection markers, and we can finally talk about connection markers. See, the study doesn't have them because it was the only location on the map. But here we see that the hallway has three connections. It connects to triangle, which is the attic. The plus is the cellar. And the red diamond is the parlor. That means you can move to any of those locations from here. And if you look at all of those locations, you'll see it's pretty much not connected. There's a hub, and then there are three different spokes we can go down. Only you can't actually go to the parlor, because most locations have flavor text on one side alone, but some locations, like the parlor, have actual text. The entrance to the parlor is blocked by a darkly glowing, unfathomable barrier. You cannot move into the parlor. So that non-italicized text tells me actual rules. I can't go in there. And I won't be able to until I have somebody with six clues in the hallway to actually progress the act and start changing the circumstances. And let's reveal the hallway now, because it's a location that we've all been moved to. And it's just a one shroud room with no clues, just a hub. I'm going to start by going up to the attic, or continue as it works, it's the second action of my turn, which forced after you move to the attic, take one horror, just you get hit for being here. And I have no reason to take it myself, I will instead assign it to Christopher Milan. Generally speaking, there's very few circumstances where it's better to put damage on yourself than your allies if it doesn't kill your allies. Those circumstances do exist, but they're edge cases and we're not going to be talking about them now. So, this is a one trial location with four clues, and we'll be getting two of them right now due to Rex being a very balanced character. That is an end result of five to one, that's passing by much more than two, and we're taking two clues and ending our turn. But let's not forget, we're also gaining a money, because Christopher Milan is very, very good. That's the end of the round. No enemies. Upkeep phase. We flip everyone. We hit our upkeep buttons, gain one resource and one card on everyone. And now we come to the top of the round, Mythos phase. Two out of three. We do not progress the agenda yet. And we draw our evil cards. Also, the round ended, so Dissonant Voices goes away.
Ancient evils. Place one doom on the current agenda. This effect can cause the current agenda to advance. This will become your favorite card in the game as you begin to dread it. So, no, I just said the agenda doesn't advance. Yeah, I was lying. The agenda totally advances. The lead investigator must decide. Oh, right. Yes. This is a mechanic that totally matters. There has to be someone labeled the lead investigator. Some decisions will involve this. It's usually relatively unimportant. You just have to pick someone and they're the lead investigator. I didn't bother even thinking about this because whenever I play, whoever I put on the left is my lead investigator just every single time. So in my case, it's Rex Murphy. So back to this, the lead investigator must decide. Either each investigator discards one card at random or the lead investigator takes two horror. Well, I have a million horror left, so I'll just take two horror rather than discarding cards. And the reason for this, if you're not familiar with card games, is as long as your life is not empty, if you're alive, then you're fine. There's no difference in full health and one health left. This is obviously not entirely true, because damage in this game is very unpredictable. But generally speaking, it's better to leverage your life as a resource than it is to lose resources by discarding cards. And now we come to the next agenda, Threshold of Seven. Oh, and whenever the agenda advances, it clears all Doom on the map. Not just on the agenda, but if there were any cards on the map that had Doom, it would clear those as well. Which brings us to the next agenda, which has a Doom Threshold of Seven. And whenever you advance the agenda, you clear all Doom. And now that was Rex's evil card was Ancient Evils. Daniela gets hers, which is the Ravenous Ghoul, which is a much more threatening enemy than the Rat. It has a Fist of Three, a Foot of Three, and a Health of Three. Now the Rat had Hunter, which meant that it would move to try to find someone to hit during its turn. This card has Prey. Prey means that if this card is given a choice of who it should attack, it will choose the person who best meets its criteria of lowest remaining health. However, since this card doesn't have anything that would cause it to disengage from Daniela Rays, it will pretty much only ever hit Daniela unless I choose to engage it with Rex. Prey is something that confuses a lot of new players because it very, very rarely ever comes up. The main time that Prey is going to happen is when a Hunter enemy that also has the Prey keyboard moves, and then they're going to actually determine where they're moving and who they're engaging with by the Prey keyword. But in this circumstance, Daniela drew the card, it spawns engaged with her, and it's never going to stop being engaged with Daniela to attack somebody else to begin with. So now we're able to take our turn. Daniela's going to be fighting the school, we'll get to that in a second. Let's do the important half of things right now, which is Rex getting all the clues. I think I am going to play Lucky Cigarette Case now that I have the ability to play it again. I wasn't able to do it last turn because the Dissonant Voices. And I'm going to investigate again at 6 to 1. The Lucky Cigarette Case says if I succeed a skill test by 2 or more, I exhaust it and draw a card. Which that's the whole thing Rex is trying to do. And in this case, I only succeed by 1 and don't do it. So let's go ahead and investigate one last time. But we do get a resource from Milan. And this time we do succeed by two. There's only one clue left, so we can't trigger Rex's ability. But we can exhaust the Lucky Cigarette Case and draw a card. And get a resource from Milan, of course. Now, what does exhausting mean? Anytime you ever see the keyword exhaust, it's going to appear before the colon in that card text. And what I mean by that is, after you succeed a skill test by two or more, exhaust Lucky Cigarette Case, colon. Over here on the wrench, you're going to see... Lightning Bolt, Exhaust Mechanics Wrench, colon, or Action, colon. Everything before the colon is the cost of using the card. If a card is ready, you can exhaust it as part of its cost. And once it's exhausted, you can't exhaust it again. So the cost is essentially once per turn. That's what exhaust means. And it will ready during the upkeep phase. So that's Rex's turn. He got two clues, two resources, and a card. Got a cigarette case in play. Let's go over now to Daniela Reyes. She needs to kill an actual threatening enemy this time. This thing hits for one horror and one sanity. Or rather, one damage and one sanity. I'm going to start by exhausting the mechanics wrench to have it attack me. I'm going to place one damage on the guard dog. And the guard dog is going to use his ability as a reaction to taking the damage. He's going to bite the enemy for one damage as well. And the horror is going to go on me. See, the moment this guard dog has three damage or one sanity on it, it will die. If I were to place this on the guard dog, since one is equal to its maximum value, it would kill it, meaning I'm going to have to take it myself. And yes, you can divide up the damage individually like this. It is not all or nothing. You can put it wherever you so please. And while I have exhausted the wrench already, you'll notice that the second ability on this is just action fight. There's no exhaust call, so you can still use it. And since this enemy just attacked me, I'm able to use it 
and I get plus two fists for the attack and deal plus one damage. So I'm attacking at seven to three for the two damage that it has, because having already taken one damage, it only needs two more to die, and it is now dead. Now with the rest of my turn, I'd rather not have to get hit every single time I want to play a card, so I'm going to play this 45 automatic for all of my money. It's just a gun, use a bullet to fight for plus one, and this attack deals plus one. It's the wrench with a little bit less fanfare, but only four uses. And as I'm now dirt broke and all my cards cost money, I'll gain a resource as my last action and my turn. There are no enemies, upkeep phase, ready everyone. Draw your cards, gain your resources. And now we're at the top of the round, the agenda gains one doom, and everyone draws their evil cards. Frozen in Fear is another very brutal card that you can get from the event decks. In general, the event decks and the core campaign are pretty rough. A lot of the hardest hitting cards that you'll see in a given scenario come from the core set, and since the core set has nothing else to pull from, they can feel quite brutal. What Frozen in Fear does is it puts itself into your threat area. And the first time that you try to move, fight, or evade in a given round, it's going to cost you an extra action. At the end of your turn, you get to test three brain, and if you succeed, you discard Frozen in Fear. So essentially, for at least one round, you're going to lose an action, and that's a third of a turn, which is brutal, and then you can't even get rid of this effect until you pass a brain three test. On Daniela's end, she is not able to play assets or events this turn. Dissonant Voices is generally pretty soft. There are turns where it hit, hits you and it's brutal, but usually you're happy to see it. It could be much worse. Okay, so in terms of sorting out Frozen and Fear and progressing the act decks, the turn's fairly straightforward. I just need to have both characters move down to the cellar and test Frozen and Fear and get ready for next turn, because this turn is sort of a holding pattern. There's a little bit of complexity to it that I'll explain as I go through. First, I'm going to have Daniela come down to the cellar. And I accidentally flipped this earlier, and as a result, it's not able to automate placing the clues on it. And then I am going to spend the next two actions drawing cards, because her hand's kind of jank right now. I've got a bunch of assets to take up slots that are already filled, and I don't have the money to play very much, so I just want to draw some more cards. Next, I'm going to have Rex move once. Frozen Fear makes that cost an additional action, and then again. Oh, and let's not get ahead of ourselves. After you enter the cellar, you take one damage. So I'm going to take one damage on Daniela and on Rex for entering this location. That's the end of Rex's turn, which means we can now test Frozen and Fear. So the part of this turn that was complicated is I needed Rex to end his turn in the same location as Daniela, which means Daniela needs to go first so we can actually go to the cellar and be optimal. And the reason for that is you cannot commit skill cards to someone else's test unless they're at your location. So let's talk about skill tests now. Because up until this point, I've been testing it like 6 to 2, 5 to 1, 7 to 3. I haven't needed to use skill cards yet. This test is three brain. Rex's brain is three. That's pretty unlikely to pass. So instead, what you want to do is you want to, is you want to do something called committing cards to the skill test. When you are taking a skill test, you may commit any number of cards to it that have matching icons. So I could commit these read the signs to it because the brains matches the skill test. There are also question mark icons like on true understanding that say that will match any sort of skill test. Now, with cards like assets and events, if you commit them, you just get the icons. The additional text at the bottom has no effect. Specific skill cards, however, like True Understanding, will actually get their text to matter. They're meant to be committed to skill tests. Now, with True Understanding specifically, I need to mention a niche rule that a lot of people don't know. You don't have to use this text on a skill card. You may choose to. So if you want to use True Understanding just for the question mark and ignore the bottom text, you could. This will almost never come up, but it does matter sometimes. Now, back to it, you may commit only to a skill test when ability printed on a scenario card. Scenario cards are pretty much everything that you didn't put into play down here. If it's not your stuff, it's a scenario card. This location, these event cards, the agenda in the act, the monsters, it's all scenario cards. And if you're successful, you discover one clue at your location. So I would love to commit this to the test. However, if I wanted to commit more cards, I could. I could commit this read the signs. If you are the one taking the skill test, you may commit an unlimited number of cards to that skill test. So now I'm up 5 to 3. I hate Frozen in Fear, I'm going to like it to be gone forever, so I'm going to commit more than that. Over here in Daniela's side, we have this card called Guts. You may commit cards to another investigator's skill test, provided two conditions. The first is you have to be at their location, which is why we needed to move them to the same place. And since Rex's skill test is happening automatically at the end of his turn, Daniela needed to go first. 
And the second criteria is that you can only commit one skill card to someone else's test. If it's someone else's, you only get to give one. You can't give unlimited the way you can for yourself. What Gut says is two brain, and if the, you can only commit one to a given test. And if the test is successful, then you draw a card. In this case, the way it's worded is different from card to card, but the way Guts is worded, the person who committed Guts draws the card, not the person who is doing the test. So now we're testing at seven to three. Not that it mattered at all, because it turns out that we're getting the Elder Sign token and we're going to pass the whole time. I could choose to automatically fail to draw three cards, but we're not going to. This is gone. True Understanding's ability triggers and Rex gains one clue. Milan's ability only triggers when you successfully investigate, not when you get a clue, so he does nothing in this case. Both of these get discarded, Guts gets discarded, and since Antonella used Guts, she gets to draw a card. And now we are at the end of the investigator round, we go on to upkeep because there are no living enemies. Flip everyone, we hit our upkeep buttons to gain our cards and resources, and we can talk about hand size because I'm sure Daniela has broken it. There is a max hand size of 8 that you check during the upkeep phase. It is right there at the very bottom. And Daniela has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 cards. So she's going to toss one. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't feel like I'm going to be needing the beat cop today. The guard dog and the 45 automatic are also the other things I'm considering discarding. Just because I have my assets fully in play, I don't need anything else. And that's the end of the round, so Dissonant Voices is gone now. To the top, we add one Doom to the clock. And now we draw our evil cards. Rex has gotten a swarm of rats. And Daniela has pulled Ancient Evils, so we're going to once again add one Doom to the agenda. We are at three of seven, still comfortably ahead of Groove. So, now it's our turns, and Rex can't do anything with the Swarm of Rats on him unless he wants to get hit by the Swarm of Rats every time he investigates. So Daniela's going to go first. She's going to engage the Swarm of Rats, because her turn really doesn't have valuable actions right now, so there's no reason to take the risk of hitting Rex. And we're just going to swing normally with our fist. Five to one. The Skull. Surprising I went this long without needing to do this, I'm going to bring this down here, is minus the number of ghouls at your location, which is a zero, so the rats are dead. And now at this point, our hand's feeling a lot better. We have a decent amount of event cards that can be used to fight, and some relevant skills. Now at this point, you may be wondering what exactly is going on with my hands. I'm sorry, but I feel like explaining all the cards in the deck that I'm not using would drag down the video a lot, but I will briefly go over and highlight each of the cards in the hands of these characters in case you want to pause the video and see what's going on. To summarize though, Daniela has redundant assets, skills that help with fighting, and a bunch of fighting events that synergize with her. And Rex has a bunch of good cards, but they don't really need to be played right now. Economy cards, clue finding cards, fighting cards, and a little bit of redundancy, but he just doesn't need to use them at the moment. And to round off this turn, I'm actually just going to gain a resource, no actually, I'm going to move back with Daniela, because I'm pretty sure we're going to be needing to move back by the end of this round. Because I think Rex is going to be getting all the clues in one action, I spend two resources to play Read the Signs. What Read the Signs does is it will add his head stat of 3 to his investigate check of 6, giving me a total of 9 to 4. And I'm going to commit Perception to this as well, which gives me 2 book, and I will succeed, draw 1 card. This is the book equivalent to Guts, there are neutral skills for every skill that do this exact same thing. And my total value is now 11 to 4. Minus 4 is normally one of the worst things you can pull, but I'm still at 7 to 4 because of all the cards I've committed. I gain one clue from the Investigate, one clue from Read the Signs, one clue from Rex Murphy, for all three clues on the location. I draw a card because of Perception, and Milan gives me a money. Oh, and I draw a card from Cigarette Case. I'm going to go ahead and move up to the central hallway location because I believe that's how we progress the act. Yes, when the round ends, investigators in the hallway may, as a group, spend the requisite number of clues to advance. And now we have a free action. We can do kind of whatever we want. If you allow me to play my turn slightly differently, bear with me here, I'm going to have played Crack the Case when I get the last clip. Crack the Case is an economy card that is fast, and you play it when someone at your location gets the last clip at a location. Investigators at the location gain a total of X resources, and X is the location's trial value. So I could give this money to somebody else so they are here, but I'll just be taking all four for myself. And then we continue the turn as normal. And as my last action, I'm going to kill Milan and replace him with Jeremiah Kirby. Now that I have a million resources, I don't really need Milan anymore. We do have four or less, the crack the case that I just played, basically. And Jeremiah Kirby is the same plus one book, but after he's played, I declare even or odd and reveal the top five cards in my deck. 
I draw the ones with the cost that matches what I send, and I shuffle the remaining into my deck. As it turns out, my Rex deck cost overwhelmingly even amounts. So, I'm just going to draw five cards and put the odd ones back. One, two, three, four, five. And in this case, I hit both my deductions, which are normally great cards, but skills don't have a value, so I can't draw them. But I still draw two cards. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want to draw more cards for a Cold Invocation, which is an attack spell that uses cards discarded from hands as fuel to make it better. And it turns out I have insider information because... Is that the end of the round? Yes. It turns out we're about to summon some rather big enemies. No enemies are on the board, so upkeep phase. Everyone draws their card, gains their resources. I forgot to put my minis this time, but it's not a big deal. And at the end of the round, I spend six clues. I have two left. And now we can flip the act. The barrier disappears, and I can reveal the parlor. I spawn Lita Chandler in the parlor, and I spawn the ghoul priest in the hallway with us. So, we can now see that there is a location over here where we can just flee the house, or we can parlay with book four to take control of Lita Chandler. Lita Chandler is a person mysteriously in this house. It is my house as the lead investigator. Don't know how she got here, or all the ghouls for that matter. And she says that each investigator at the location gets plus one fist. When an investigator at the location successfully attacks a monster enemy, like the one we just spawned, which we'll get to in a second, that investigator deals plus one damage. So this is the first time in the game that you find out a very important mechanic. Sometimes progressing the act can be really damn dangerous. The ghoul priest has four fists and four foot, the highest we've seen so far. And he has five per investigator health, which means that, unlike most enemies, he scales up depending on the number of players you have. He has 10 health, which is a massive amount, and he has Prey Highest Fist. Since he was spawned not by either player, he actually follows the Prey rules, and he goes to Daniela. He has Hunter, which we've talked about before. It'll cause him to move if he's just idle and not engaged with anyone. But he also has Retaliate, which means if you attack him and miss, he's just going to hit you. And unlike all our previous enemies that hit for one, this guy hits for two damage and two sanity. He hits like a truck. And if you miss, he's going to penalize you. In your first playthrough, there's a very good chance you don't kill the Ghoul Priest. Especially, especially if you're playing with four players, and he shows up with 20 health, but you only have one really dedicated fighter. However, we're not quite to our turns yet. That was the end of the round, so we have to take our evil cards. Four of seven, Doom. There's a Swarm of Rats on Rex Murphy. Oh, I think I might have to discard a card over here because of hand size. Yes, I do. It is well past the point of staying together. It can leave. And Rotting Remains on Daniela Reigns. Test three brain for each point you fail by. Take one horror. That's actually quite scary, but I have guts in hand, and I have four base, so I'm testing it six to three. As long as I don't hit auto fail, which we'll probably get to explain at some point in the video, it'll be fine. Thankfully, it wasn't now. I get minus one for the one ghoul, and I pass. So as Rex Murphy, I'm going to start my turn by moving into the parlor. Now, the way that attacks opportunity work is that the moment you trigger the action, it resolves immediately, before that you've actually done the thing. If I were to gain a resource, the rat would hit me, and then I would gain a resource. So it hits me while I'm still in the same room as Daniela Reyes, allowing Daniela Reyes to play a card called Heroic Rescue for one. This says fast, and I play it when a non-lead enemy, such as a pile of rats, would attack another investigator at your location. I engage that enemy, resolve its attack against me instead, so I'll take one damage. And now I just deal one damage to it, which kills the rat. Next, as Rex, I'm going to parlay with Lita Chandler. That is a book four test to take control of her, and I will commit Rex's unique asset to this. Rex's unique card could be played as an event that draws you up to five cards, which is really good, but here I'm just committing it for its two books and its wild for a total of plus three, getting me to eight to four. Hey, we get to talk about the autofail after all. And as always, it is well timed. So autofail says the following. You fail the skill test as though you had rolled a zero. So first of all, obviously I fail and I don't get lead to Chandler and committing this was a complete waste. But second of all, there is no way, barring exactly one card that's printed much down the line, to make this not a failure. And since you fail as though you got a zero, on some cards it's especially brutal. On that Rotting Remains test just now, if you get auto fail, then you have a final value of zero. You take the full three horror, and it's brutal. 
And as a quick note, by the way, uh, the final value you get on a skill test can never be below zero. After you do all of your skills and everything, if that number is still under zero, then before you resolve the skill test, you increase it to zero. So rotting remains is maximum damage will always be three because the skill test difficulty is three. Now, um, I suppose that I'm going to try to do that again. I'm going to commit Christopher Milan and Preposterous Sketches to test at 7 to 4. Minus 1. I get control over this time. She takes up an ally asset, which means that Jeremiah Kirby has to go. And as my last action, it's not action action, it's a fast action, I play Shortcut. Shortcut is fast, and I can choose an investigator at my location, in this case me, and move that investigator to a connecting location. So I pop back over. Like I said earlier, Lita Chandler has this text. When an investigator at your location successfully attacks a monster enemy, that investigator deals plus one damage. So now we can deal with the school priest much easier because we're dealing more damage with every hit. Now, a rules thing I have to clarify now that's kind of high level and won't come up very often is this card says, as an additional cost to perform this attack, the chosen enemy makes an attack against you. Dodge says, when an enemy attacks an investigator at your location, it cancel that attack. You cannot cancel the cost of a card, which means that if I were to try to play dodge on toe-to-toe, -to -toe, it would just cancel the toe-to-toe -to -toe entirely. It's very niche and doesn't come up often, but it's worth noting that these cards don't come together quite as well as it looks like they do. But I still play toe-to-toe -to -toe for zero resources. As an additional cost, he's going to attack me. He's going to deal one damage to the guard dog, two horror to me, and one damage to me. The guard dog's going to hit him for one, but I believe that does not matter. Yes, Lita Chandler only cares if you successfully attack, and the guard dog is not an attack. Now, however, the toe-to-toe -to -toe is an attack. I deal plus one damage, so two damage by base. This goes up to three, and then Lita Chandler's effect increases it to four. Because I'm an attack, I can now use the wrench, which is actually better than the gun if I've met its criteria. And I'm going to attack with the wrench. I'm going to emit a vicious blow and daring. All right, after a brief bit of math, I've realized that I don't need to commit Daring. Vicious Blow gets me to 8, which means only Auto Fail will cause me to miss this. Minus 1, I hit. He takes 2 damage from the Wrench, 1 damage from a Vicious Blow, and 1 damage from Lita Chandler. But the game is not cooperating right now in adjusting this value. There we go. Bringing us up to 8. 1 damage from Guard Dog, 3 damage from our first attack with Lita Chandler, and 4 from our second attack with Lita Chandler and Vicious Blow. Which means, provided we don't get unlucky with this last tick, we're using Daring to go up plus 3, bring our total value to 5, 8, 10 to 4. We're fine. If we hit, he's dead. Now, unfortunately, if we miss, it's very, very bad. But hey, sometimes you get got. Sometimes you get got. For a hot second there, I was laughing at the fact that I died in my tutorial video before I remembered that I'm playing Daniela, and this is all a part of the plan. I spend one resource to play dodge and cancel the attack because as he ha does have retaliate, he would have hit me since I missed. And then I activate her ability. Since he attacked me as a result of retaliate, I'm able to trigger this and I evade him automatically. So he will not be hitting me during the next phase either. Now, for the first time ever, there's a living enemy at the end of the investigator phase, so we go to enemy phase. Enemies with the hunter keyword move towards the nearest investigator. Well. He does have Hunter, but he's not ready, so he doesn't. It doesn't say this in the enemy phase, but it is the case. Each engaged enemy attacks if able, but he's not able to engage because he's not readied. Upkeep phase. Ready everything, which includes the Ghoul Priest, and he again engages with Daniela because she has the highest uh, fist. We draw our cards, and we gain our resources. Doom goes up to 5 of 7, and we draw our evil cards. Rotting remains. Test 3 to 3. And I have no way to pump this, and... I'm way more concerned about Daniela than I am about Rex right now, so I'll just take, take this test as it is. It's a minus one, so he's going to take one horror. I'll go ahead and put that on Lita Chandler instead. And for Daniela, we got Frozen in Fear. Which, as you might imagine, is bad when you're trying to deal with enemies, but it should be okay. Because we've already largely dealt with this enemy, and the scenario is basically over. I forgot to mention, after we resolved spotting the Ghoul Priest, the current act's objective is just kill the Ghoul Priest. Alternatively, you could have just left. You can just resign. You don't have to fight him to the death if you don't think you can take him. To be clear, though, you have to have a resign action printed on a card to do that. You can't just choose to quit whenever you want. You have to actually have a viable exit from the situation, like the front door to your house. 
Which brings us back to the investigator turns, and hopefully we don't auto-fail everything this time. First action, I'm going to attack. I don't have plus two for this attack, though. So in this scenario, you can almost certainly kill the ghoul priest by shooting him with a gun. I'll be shooting at six to four, and if he tries to hit me, I can use my ability to uh, just evade him so that he'll never hit me on my subsequent shots. That's pretty much guaranteed to work. I can also just play a guard dog and use reflect damage from guard dogs to kill him, taking most of the damage automatically. It all works. I'm going to choose to shoot him. It's more satisfying. First bullets, minus one is a hit, and that kills him. Two damage from the bullet, run from the Chandler, that's overkill even. And for the first time, let's talk about victory. Because not only did we just win this scenario, so we advance to resolution uh, one or two, depending on my story decision. But we're putting a character in the victory display. You may not have noticed, there are locations that say victory one of them in the bottom right. And at the end of a scenario, you get victory points turned into experience. If there's a location that has victory on it and you got all the clues, you get an experience for that. And likewise, if you kill a monster that has victory on it, rather than putting it in the discard pile, you put it over here in the victory display. And at the end of the scenario, you'll get experience for those too. So this gives me four experience, which is actually rather unlucky. I dealt with all the monsters in this scenario pretty handily. There are actually two monsters in this pile here that could have given me more victory. But it is what it is. There are various house rules that various people play with to get around this sort of thing. But for the sake of a tutorial, I'm just showing you what happened is what I'm doing. I got four experience. Which is the maximum for what I saw, and I could theoretically have gotten much more. I could have sandbagged for a long time, just hung out in the hallway without advancing the act. Just drawing cards until I got more victory points. But that's very boring and not for good gameplay or good content. So here we are. So to wrap this up, now that the scenario is over, I'm going to go ahead and say that we decided to burn down my home. And the effects of Resolution 1 are that we record the house is burned to the ground because this is a continuous story. So we burn the house to the ground. And uh, the lead investigator, which is Rex, gets to add Lita to his deck. It's not actually good for Rex at all, but I'll do it because of story reasons. If I were really trying to optimize, I would definitely have Daniela be the lead investigator so that she could get Lita Chandler, but oh well. Which again comes into people house ruling things, just not caring about lead investigators, but for the purpose of this video, doing it the way it's supposed to be. I also suffer one mental trauma on Rex, which is another thing we get to have a tutorial on. What mental trauma means, and you mark it down in the campaign log up here, we have Rex and Daniela. And there are tallies for mental trauma and physical trauma. And that's the amount of horror and damage you spawn with. When you start the scenario, he's going to have this much on him. These numbers are going to set back to their previous values of zeros and fives because of the mental trauma, he's just going to spawn in with one mental damage already taken. And lastly, we gain victory X equal to all the victory I was just talking about, but we also gain two bonus experience as we gain insight into the hidden world of the mythos. So it turns out they gain six experience. And since this video is drawing long already due to me explaining the basic concepts of the game, we'll talk about decks and deck upgrading next time on Arkham Horror the Card Game. I've been Rather Incoherence, I hope this was helpful, or at the very least that you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next one.